Thank you, Sean. Um, I'm, I'm not an economist or an engineer. I'm a political economist. So uh, I'll, I'll actually try to show you some political economic equations um, in, in a few minutes. Um, and yesterday's talks, and they're all fascinating, um, you know, caused me to go back last night and sort of rearrange my presentation. So I won't talk as much about lags uh, in regulation as I will just regulation in general. Because I think you have to try to understand how what you're trying to do gets synthesized by the, this quasi-political process and turned into the actual prices that customers are going to see. Uh, so in that sense, uh, let me give you the, the fundamental equation. Right? What we want to try to do is make sure that the total revenues equal the total cost of your utility. Right? When we say that the total costs are going to be the rate base, now, I'm going to make up a whole new language for you, and I'm not going to tell you everything about it because if I did, then I'd be giving away my consulting secrets, right? I have to have some way to have value added. Actually, rate base is just all your capital investment. You haven't seen this before. And what we do is subtract off the accumulated depreciation that occurs over time for all of this. So when you want to put in smart grid and invest hundreds of millions of dollars, that's where it's going to go in this equation. And that's how the regulator is going to look at it when it comes into them for approval or disapproval, as the case may be. Now then what we do is take the rate of return, which is going to be a weighted average of the debt and equity that's used by the utility to finance this construction that goes on. We have the operating expenses. Taxes, which we can't escape, right? And then the annual depreciation is actually considered a cost of doing business in this period, right, as it wears out. But then it's all, you know, this D is just the sum of the little Ds over, you know, time that you've, you've had from the life of each one of these pieces of equipment that have gone in to create your utility, whether it's wires, everything else. This is the fundamental equation. Right? And then to make it worse for you, for all of you who are really interested in prices, what we do is we take the total revenue or the total cost and divide it by Q and we get a price. Q, the output of the to total output kilowatts on the system. Now when we get really sophisticated, we take this total and we actually break it down into residential bucket, a commercial bucket, and an industrial bucket. And then we divide each of those total costs or revenues for that group by the Q of the total kilowatt hours of their particular group and get a price. Now, I'm, I'm oversimplifying a little bit. But, but you have to understand that everything you're talking about that's going on at that wholesale you know, level and what you want to pass down as prices, every vertically integrated company in the United States is regulated using this mechanism. Every distribution company who is in a restructured state is regulated using this equation, except that what's happened to them is all the generation that was part of the rate base has been pulled out and taken away and either put into a subsidiary who's competing in those wholesale markets you're looking at, or they sold it off and it's now somebody else's. And their job, not to put too fine a point on it, is their toll, toll collector for the electricity that passes through from the wholesale market to the end user. So this is the world. Then there's probably also uh, another equation that we might have, uh, something like this. Customer anger is a function of high prices and poor service. So those are the three fundamental equations that we have to think about when we're doing our, our regulatory work. And, and so 
You know, and, and it's really important because, you know, when we talk about how it's going to affect the customers and all the people that are involved in this process, <clears throat> you have to understand they don't know how, that that's how their rates have been set. They generally don't have a clue. Just like when they flip the switch to turn on the light, they don't have a clue about how that energy came and made the light go on. So, you know, it's important to put into perspective so that you and I could argue about the fact that if I invest $200 million in smart grid in order to bump this part up, what happens to the customer's rates? Well, they go up. Now, what's supposed to happen? Now, I, and, and I, I'm just saying, I'll call it smart grid. I'm not, not going to talk about actual smart meters and smart customers and going actually into the home and expecting them to do something, which has been the argument to, you know, over the past two days is, do we, con do we just the hell with the customer? Let's just control the hell out of them. Uh, <laughs> or or let, you know, can we trust their behavior to actually make the system work in a rational fashion? So, so what, what should happen is that when we invested that money into the system, just to make a better smart grid, what we would expect to see is this to decline because there's going to be operations and maintenance savings that are going to occur as a result of that investment. Because right now, when there's a power outage, the guy gets in a truck and drives along the line looking to see where the brake is. right? And what you're going to do, and so they, we spend millions of dollars in overtime and things of that nature to actually maintenance the system. So if we make it a smart grid and we have the GPS on it and we know where the brake is, the truck just drives right to where the problem is and we just cut our overtime expenditures and all the other problems that we face. And so that comes down over time. But your rates went up first. And then over time, your rates can go down. So there's a front end loading problem in a sense, right? The customer just sees the rate shock of having to put in this stuff. And so they, high prices, <laughs> customer anger, and, and the feedback effect, which when I talk about the political economist in myself as a former commissioner, that's when they call the governor's office. And then he calls us and says, what the hell's going on? So <clears throat> I just want to sort of put this into perspective and, <clears throat> and then give a little bit more historical context over, over you know, how this model plays into effect. And think about the historic role of price, which we've been all concerned about, in the traditional regulatory world. So in the 1890s, when we first build our electric systems out for the, in the United States, the state of economic theory for all, you know, was Alfred Marshall. And Alfred Marshall could, be, you know, let's say, has, has two chapters in his book, monopoly and competition, right? And monopoly means that there are no substitute goods. So what's the role of price? Price normally would be, oh, well, if, if this good is higher than that good, I'm going to substitute my you know, goods and I'm going to minimize my cost of living and all of that sort of stuff. But in this case, we have a single market, single supplier, and a price doesn't really play a function as a substitute. So what is it? It's just a revenue recovery mechanism. It takes these costs, figure out a price, and get the customer to pay for it. Meters are just to make sure that the bill we send you has your consumption on it and not somebody else's, right? So we're trying to figure out how to divide up the cost of that big system. And so the meter technology is simple, the price is simple, and we're not asking you to behave in any particular way. So as we go through time, and then what did we do? You know, if you, you ever see some of the, I should have maybe, if I would have thought that that the conversation was going to go this way, I would have brought you some slides where I would have shown you the pictures of the wagons that would come around to the houses with all the fans and different appliances that we could start to sell you. And I might have brought the wonderful um, EEI advertisement from 1956, maybe 1954, out of Look Magazine. And it has set up in a way like this where 
it has a list of all of the appliances that you could have in your house. And down here it has your, your wife frantically working to try to make a, you know, the house nice because she doesn't have any of these things, right? It's horrible. And then, but as you go up the list, there's a heart kind of up at the top. And this marital bliss, I think, has been achieved because she now has time because she's, you know, has every appliance in the world and life is easy and she's ready to be able to meet you when you come in the door. So we have this whole idea that you should consume more. We were proud of the fact that we consumed and generated half of the energy in the world in the United States. This was our goal. Most of you don't remember the kitchen debates that occurred between Khrushchev and <clears throat> uh, Nixon uh, at the time. And it was about whether or not we could actually supply these wonderful kitchens and all these appliances to our customers under capitalism versus what they could do under communism. And there was this you know, and so this was a point of pride that you consume, right? And we want to make your life better. What, think about it, living better electrically. So that's the story. That's what we're trying to, you know, do in this world. So, you know, consumption, you're a passive participant. You just buy the appliances, put them in your house, and live a better life, a, a safer life, a more relaxed life. And, and there's a culture of consumption. So we don't, we don't want you to do any of the things we've been talking about doing, <laughs> you know, making you think for a living. So we have that, that kind of an idea. So then what happens is we get shocked by OPEC oil and the price of energy goes up and oh my God, you know, life has been turned on its head. But what was our first reaction? Well, we'll make appliances more efficient. We won't ask you to become better consumers and more thoughtful people, right? We don't want the heaven forbid. We know the kind of resistance we're going to get. So we make appliances more efficient. We make power plants more efficient. We try to make the grids more efficient. We do anything through equipment rather than through behavior. So that's kind of the, the, the layout. And then from a customer's point of view, from the psychology of like sort of regret and rejoice, this prospect theory, Kahneman, Tversky out of Stanford, people like that have done work where, you know, we notice the regret because when the outages come, poor service, <laughs> the anger is palpable, right? So we, we can measure the, the cost of the regret when the system fails, but what happens when it's, when it's going okay? There's no rejoice. There's no dollar values there. Now, we're trying to make some of that here in the discussions I've heard, right? If we can give you access to the capacity markets and we can get you, you know, some of the savings and be able to have you aggregate your, you know, reductions and sell that into the market and then get a piece of the action, then you might start seeing some value to the, the, the goodness of the grid and everything else. But right now, you don't see that. Hell, when we tried to put prepaid meters in for people's houses. There was a stigma attached to that. People didn't want to have to have that in so that they could keep inside their budgets and actually run their, their appliances and everything in their homes well. So we get pushbacks on things like that. We get pushbacks on what? Health, intergenerational equity, because I'm going to spend all this money for smart grid up front. It takes you five years to put it in. And if I'm 89 now, and I'm dead the day the, turn, the system turns on, right? So I got to pay for it for five years, but didn't get any benefit out of it. That's AARP's argument, right? A legitimate argument from AARP's perspective that you're asking me to have to pay up front for stuff I don't have any benefits from. And generally, when we interpret this equation, it's usually costs have to have a benefit for the customer to be getting their money. And, and getting a service. So if we can't show that there's a service already that the system has been fixed, and then in California, if I'm not mistaken, one of the PSE and G had to sort of pull back on some of their smart grid stuff because people were afraid of the equipment. And you know, 
EMF or you know, pick your poison, I guess we'd say, uh, is, is the sort of thing. So we have all of these types of interactions that we have to overcome. Now, it's true that in restructured states where this equation only applies to the distribution company that we now have sort of a, a modified equation and we have here, your, you know, your commodity. There's a cost of the commodity that we're going to add on. That's just we're going to pass that through. It's like a fuel adjustment clause or something of that nature. So the work we do to try to make the wholesale market more efficient will end up coming through and, and helping them that way, hopefully. So that's, that's part of what we see as the future benefits of having a good market, a wholesale market, one where demand response and things of that nature can help us. <clears throat> you, know, frankly, you know, the unintended consequences of well-intended actions, that seems to be a common problem <laughs> that, that occurs. And we were talking about a little bit yesterday and, and even a little bit today. Oh, the system evolved into this thing where we could start trading with one another, right? We start out with what? Power plants were at the load centers. Well, then those noisy, dirty things had to be moved outside of town into the suburbs. Well, or outside of town until the suburbs moved out to that part of the area. And then we started moving them out to mine mouths right? so the coal fire plant could be by the source of its fuel. And because your mine was across the way from my mine and my power lines cross your power lines, we start interconnecting with one another. And we sort of create this, there's a path dependency, right? It just sort of happened that the grid developed the way it did. And then because of that, we could exchange power with each other. And, and now all of a sudden, oh, we want to benefit from all of that. Well, again, the customer who doesn't understand when they flip the light switch where the power comes from, don't look at that evolution and think anything about it. It's just water off the duck's back, so to speak. They don't care. That's not helping them. Yesterday, we also talked about why are we talking about kilowatt hours. Well, at one point in time in, in this industry, we were talking about convergence. We talked about gas companies merging with electric companies, and we were going to go away from kilowatt hours and electricity and therms uh, for, the, for the gas company and just talk about BTU content and try to minimize the cost of the system by trying to minimize the energy inputs that were being used. And that just kind of went away, partly because mergers didn't <laughs> pan out the way it was and the industries kind of stayed separate. So what, in, in effect, the customers want, you know, when you talk to them, is pots. I wish I could have come up with a pans analogy, but I couldn't figure that out. But pots was plain old telephone service. That's the black rotary dial phone. You know, I get it at a low cost. I, it's, a, it's a nice system. That's what these people want. They want their 1950s electric system without outages. <laughs> And, and, and that's what they're looking at. So when we get into this debate about how should we control them and how should we offer them, we have to really have a clear vision of what we're selling to the customers. If there are simple contracts, if there are simple things to try to get them engaged on this side, it's going to have to be that way because this is, the, this is sort of their mentality. Now, I know that's a broad generalization. That's what political economists do. <laughs> we make broad generalizations like that. But when I'm teaching these classes to my students at the University of Illinois, and we're talking about these things, I, I sometimes teach the night classes where there's half the people are over 35, and the other half are college-age students. And if I start talking about prices to devices, one half of the room lights up. The other half of the room sees their VCR blinking. Right? And I don't know how to fix it. Right? So, so that one group is looking at the, you know, all this wonderful stuff and saying, well, I'm not sure how I'm going to deal with that. But the other half kind of go, wow, I could get an app for that. Right? And, and I could, you know, I, you mean I could, you know, control my whole house through doing all this? And yes, you could. You know, and I'm like, oh, that's cool. Well, you know, so half of them are going to be thinking about it and half not. So maybe the, 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 the value of waiting <laughs> is that, you know, all the older folks who you know, don't want to be involved, uh, you know, we can move on and... Well, they see their bill getting lower. 
Oh, they, yeah, well, they, they believe that. <laughs> so skeptical. <laughs> no, they, they actually do. It's, um, you know, because they, they see the ability of the, if, if, if I have a, a refrigerator that right now runs and isn't controlled in some way and wouldn't be smart, uh, but I could wire it up so that I have an app that says if this, if the price is over 14 cents, you know, delay your turn on until the price falls, or if it, you know, doesn't go down by that, by the time you need to turn on to save my food, then turn on, you know, but they'd be willing to program it that way so that they could run their house. And if they can cut their $300 a, a month bill down to, you know, $150, then they see the benefit of that. And they're, they're okay with that. Now. They're also living in a dorm and don't know what the cost of running a house is or whether and, and, have, and have, haven't had to make those kinds of decisions t typically. But, you know, that, that's part of what they think about. Um, now, here's my layered model. It's the customer's layers of expenses. It's modernization. You want more money for that. You want more money to fix the growth that's going on in our system. You want to harden it against storms. You want to smarten it. You want to secure it. And all I want is my 1950s electrons. And so every one of those things is going in here to make that number higher for my, cons for my, my price and my bill. And I'm not really sure why you want to do that to me. It's not quite the layered model you guys are using. but. Again, I'm trying to give you the, the customer side, is it? So that regulatory process is an, you know, an archaic institution in some sense. Byzantine was the word we used on the bus the, the other morning. Um, it can take as long as 18 months to have a rate case. So let me, let me you know, think about this. When I talked about regulatory lag in the title of the, of the speech that I'm not going to give, um, Basically, what a lag is, is the time between when your costs change and when you can get your rate changed, okay? So there's some kind of cost change that occurs here. What does the utility have to do? Well, first of all, they have to decide whether it's worth going in for a rate case because not all cost changes are going to be of a magnitude that they're interested in going through what they consider a rather onerous process to, to get their rates changed. So they make the decision, they're thinking about this, and now then you have to understand, how long does it take a company to prepare to put a rate case on? Because they have the burden of proof. They have to come in and show what all their costs are and why they need an increase. So there's a delta going on. There's a delta rate base. There's a delta operating expenses. Whatever those deltas are, they have to prove that up in their, in their case. So it could take six months to get all that information together once you've identified that it's really worth it. And then you, you file the case. And depending upon the legal situation that you're in, it could be anywhere from six more months to 18 months to have the case go on. So you're absorbing the costs during that time. That's what regulatory lag is. And so that's why companies, you know, shudder <laughs> to think, if, I'm, if you're going to tell me I should go out and spend this money and then you know, I'm going to put it in the rate base and I'm going to want to come in and have a rate case, am I going to get it all? So what they've argued for is a whole bunch of alternative forms of regulation. They don't want to be under this and they don't want to be under the onerous rules that are associated with it. So they ask for things like trackers. So a tracker may be a mechanism that says you go out and spend $10 million a month on system upgrades for your smart grid and we'll allow you to put that into your rate base and increase prices every month. In a sense, what it typically is, it's almost like a fuel adjustment clause. It's a separate item. It's not like they're putting it in the rate base. It's just going to cause your rates to go up every month. So that $10 million goes in every month. And at the end of the year, we'll take a look at that $120 million, and you'll have to prove up whether or not you did that prudently. And if you didn't do it prudently, we may not give it all to you. So that's the process. And so this regulatory lag and all of that that goes on can be kind of a problem. Riders are just another mechanism like a tracker, uh, in fact, a fuel adjustment clause. We, we took fuel out of this equation a long time ago 
uh, because it's large. Some, some cases, what, 60% of your cost as a utility would be fuel costs. So it's large, it's volatile, fluctuates a lot, especially after uh, the OPEC oil crisis. You look at the prices of fuel that were being purchased. And it's outside management's control, because it's typically stuff you're buying in a marketplace, and you don't have any control over that. So those three litmus tests, if it passes, you can become a rider and allow that to pass through on an independent basis. You'd still be audited. There's still a fuel audit. So the regulatory process isn't giving you a blank check. I don't want to make you know, again, you have that idea. But that's, that's what goes on. Uh, PBR is Pabst Blue Ribbon. No, it's uh, performance-based regulation. Uh, tell you, you're not all blue collar. <laughs> Earnings sharing mechanisms, ESM, these are just what, what, what would happen here is we would take this rate of return and as I said, this is really debt and equity. <clears throat> and if we were giving you, say, 15% on your equity, I'm not testifying to that number at the moment, but you know, if you were getting 15% on equity, what would happen is we might create a dead band around it and say 16 and 14. If your return fluctuates, you know, because what, what happens is we set your rates after we've determined your, in your rate case, what your costs are. So if you can control costs, lower your operating expenditures, and in effect earn 16, we'd let you keep it. If you can keep controlling your expenses until you get up into the, say, 17%, what we might do is share that 50-50 with the customers, so customers would start getting a rebate back as a result of their company's efficiency. So that's what an earnings sharing mechanism is like. And likewise, if you fall down, you don't get 100% recovery of any overruns you're doing, you'd only get 50%. You'd have to absorb some of it. So there's the incentive to try to control your cost. What's a failure with this sometimes? What would people be concerned about? And the kind of concerns I have, not, not that the system's unstable, is what? That these people would cut quality of service locally in order to have lower costs, so we'd have low service, which Poor service, customer anger. A lot of the performance-based regulation plans got shot down after a while because of that. Or what we did is we put performance criteria into the mechanism. So this is just some of the real world stuff that goes on. Here's some of the, this is the frequency of rate cases from 1990 up to 2012, and it's on a quarterly basis. So you can see that you know, during the 90s, what happened is, you know, rate cases tailed off. And there was, a, it was a, quite a reduction. Now we're on this path upwards. So there's lots of this going on. And so, you know, people are worried about um, regulatory lag and how that's affecting them. Here is the ROE, which is the return on equity, this part. Look what's happening to that over time. So you can see that there's a downward slide on the return on equity, which is causing utilities to have a bit of a heartburn. T-bills, yeah, if I put the T-bills on, what would that be? It would be going down to, well, the scales would be down to zero down here, yeah. So, they're, they're, you know, so if you, if, and, and what, what David's really talking about there is if you're using a capital asset pricing model type thing, it's the risk-free rate plus uh, uh, beta, which is a risk factor, times the, the, the market rate minus the risk-free rate. And, and that's how we would price it. So if the risk-free rate is a T-bill and T-bills are dropping, what would we expect for the return on equity to, to do? It would drop as well like a rock. And that's what's happening in part here. But it's still, why do I say it gives them angst? The problem here is another institutional sort of change that's occurred. In the 1950s, 60s, and even into the 70s, a utility was a niche market. Always gave you 8 to 10 percent, no risk, kind of went along. What happened to the finance markets? They, they evolved in ways in which now a utility stock has got to be in a portfolio, and if it's not performing the same way that Google or Microsoft or other stocks are performing in there, then they're having problems. 
fi Wall Street's going to say bad things about them. So they want to see their numbers up so that they can be in the portfolio on an equal basis and not look like the crisis child in the finance market. So, so they, they have this desire to you know, see their numbers go up or, or they get really concerned when they go down. This is, I just, I, I went and put this in last night. These are the significant US weather related grid disturbances. This is from um, a Congressional Research Service report that just came out uh, about, a, I think, within the last year. Uh, well, yeah, it's, 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 the data is from up to May of 12. So, um, so you can see they were, they were low. They fluctuated. Now they're becoming huge numbers, and they're, and they're fluctuating even more, which starts to turn that into what? Large? <laughs> Potentially large. Look at the damages that occurred with Sandy. Billions of dollars we're looking at, right, in, in the total package. But for the utilities, hundreds of millions of dollars. You in Florida know this better than anybody else. What, six, seven years ago, you had three hurricanes come through simultaneously in that year, and you had to rebuild your system and harden it, and then rebuild it and harden it and, and, and spend a lot of money on that. And what did your st state commission do? You, you took one of those tracker mechanisms and put that damage, that repair costs in a separate item that passed through to customers because you realize it's starting to look like this. But I think this could be the new weather norm, <laughs> not the kind of old way we think about the system. And so this is another crisis thing that a utility commission has to worry about. And we're particularly worried about it because it's affecting that grid that's bringing us the reliability and everything else we want and brings us our market prices from the wholesale market. Well, generators were doing better. <laughs> yeah, they, they, yeah, they, they were. Um, and there are moments now. I mean, this is part. As David said, they're they're concerned about you know the the offering of the money for demand response. They're mad about wind, right? I mean, I'm I'm a, a witness in a case where we're bringing a new DC line into Illinois from northern Iowa. It's bringing 3,300 megawatts of wind into Morris, Illinois. And when you dump that into the LMP model, what happens? <laughs> and uh, my testimony, in Illinois, we have a, a law that says you have to show benefits to customers of any new power line that comes in. Well, all I have to do is run the LMP model <laughs> and show that they've dropped precipitously, and, they, oh, and it changes color on the, on the maps. <laughs> and, and, and so there, there it is. But what's that doing? For, for people who own nukes, who used to be the base load running at night, and the wind's coming in from Iowa at night, and it's got zero marginal cost in the model, right? So though that's ending up causing havoc and pushing those prices down, so they're not able to get the return that they were expecting, and so they don't like that as well. And yet this is all the RPS standards that are being put on them, you know, by well-intended consequences. Yeah. Um, this was the average regulatory lag that was happening up until the 2000s. You can see that it was starting to go up actually in towards the, the 20 month. Well, you know, oh, I've got five minutes? No, I'm going to keep going. Um, I'm on a roll. <laughs> You see this drop off, and, and, and while it has dropped off to around 10 months, but sometimes gets up to 15, um, part of this is because a number of states passed the utilities, went to their legislators and said, I, like Michigan had an open-ended, there is no statutory time. So it went 24 months, 30 months for, for rate cases. That's now, I believe, nine months in their state. So, you have reactions like that. But they're still bothered by the fact that if it takes 10 to 12 months to have a rate case done, I'm still absorbing all that money. So they're concerned about that. <clears throat> I've defined that's kind of the regulatory lags we were talking about. Uh, yeah, yeah, the introduction. See, <laughs> now, this is the paper. <laughs> Everything else was just reaction to it. But remember that what's going on is they want prudence reviews of everything you do. Um, 
There's going to be appeals to market discipline. Now, every time you come in and want to put more money in that rate base, <clears throat> the system is going to have reactions to that, and it, it's hard for the utilities to come forward in doing it. So just, I, I mean, the purpose, I guess, of my talk has just been to, you know, rem think about in the background of all the work you're doing, what's going to have to happen for this to actually get implemented and the process by which that gets implemented in the real world. All right, I'm done. Oh, no, you said that. No, no. <laughs> oh, do we? <laughs> zero energy homes fit into your model? Oh, well, um, well again, uh, if, you know, for a progressive member of AARP who wants to have, you know, vehicle to grid and, and an energy efficient world and things of that nature, they're, they're, they're going out and doing it as individuals. But AARP and other groups are saying, look, on a general level, if you're going out and spending money and sticking it in that rate base and increasing all of our rates, I may not, you know, my members may not be personally benefiting from all of that because they don't, they don't want smart meters. They want 1950s, so let, you know, turn on the switch, have the lights come on, watch the television, fall asleep, and, you know, do their normal stuff. And so they don't, you know, they don't see the benefits of smart grid or all this other stuff. So that's one resistance. But yet, let me tell you that in, in many states, the, uh, the Attorney General's office um, has been opposed to a lot of these things, or they're looking at you know, wanting very judicious proving up of the cost benefits. Remember that the cost benefits in many of these cases, when smart grid's been presented to states, it's, you have all that upfront cost that comes in. And so we have to assume that there's going to be not just the O&M expenditures that reduce, that help balance that out, but we've actually, and I think we talked about it a little bit, that there are some assumptions of future benefits that are going to come. Well, you know, attorney general's offices and other consumer cub citizens utility boards and other groups like that are skeptical of those numbers. And so they think that we're just going to get a big lump of cost and not a whole lot of benefit in the future, and it's hard to prove to them, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that they're going to benefit. Well, I mean, that takes, their, it takes the battle out of there. So what will happen is they're going to be in Congress fighting that because that's where they'll go, right? You just move the venue. So they'll, they'll, you, they'll be there along with the consumers union and others that will fight that battle at that level. But you're right. It would move the battle away from the state. Yeah, I mean, if, if after we get all this in, because right now what we have are dumb cars, dumb grids, and dumb prices, and dumb cubed doesn't do it, right? Uh, you know, because I can pull up to your house, plug in, and, and if I'm taking power out of your house, there's nothing that says, hey, this is Carl McDermott's car that's plugged into your house, and you ought to bill this to him. No, you're going to get get the bill. Now I realize I want 50 cents or something like that if I charge up during dinner at your house. But uh, nevertheless, the dumb, you know, we need that all in place. And then once it's all in place, then the, there are going to be people who will say, yeah, let's, this will be something I can benefit from. I've held the electric vehicle conferences. I had the car from Delaware. And we earned $3.40 the night it got plugged into the, to the station where we were holding the, uh, the conference. And the next day when the conference started, and we had the meter right there to show how much they had made on selling power back into the grid. It's a great deal. Now then you have to think about the price of the car. And you've got to have sources of money to actually offset the higher price of the car. So there's a, there's a lot of trade-offs. So, so the title of your talk originally was How to Recover the Costs uh, <laughs> of New Infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And I understand that, I mean, let's take your little equation there. And okay. we have this huge upfront cost. And we've got some cost savings coming ahead. And let's suppose that the cost benefit, the net present discounted value of all this is positive. Uh, can, um, 
it, I have sort of two part question. One is can't the utility uh, access the private capital markets and uh, uh, amortize that, that upfront expense in some way that would be handled naturally by the regulatory process? That's an interesting securitize I mean, the uh, yeah. To I smart mean, grid. I mean, are, are, is there anybody trying to work on these kinds of things? No, I think you just got yourself a whole boat of, load of testimony you're going to be giving around the country. <laughs> I mean, I, I just I, it's a naive question. No, I, 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 mean, I, I don't think I, people, I, I don't offhand know of anybody who's securitizing. Do you? Well, th so what what happens is in, in Carl's equation, it's either equity or it's debt. Right. And if you try to do leases, um, there is the possibility to do capitalized leases, but operating leases are treated as operational expense, yeah. um, which uh, which they don't like because obviously that increases opex, uh, which is a problem uh, in many cases. But uh, uh, but it also means that you reduce your uh, return on on rate base. Now the the other is that you you can do the capital lease, but uh, that doesn't really solve the problem because now uh, you got it. In many cases, that debt equity has to be about 50 percent. Uh, you can actually float more stock to cover it uh, in some way that would sort of be in that uh, sort of more but from would private there be equity. Would a way to sort of securitize this the particular? Let's say we did a bond, the special bond on on smart grid, and then and had it recovered from. Yeah, you know, you're still gonna have to raise the exactly. rates to get the current. Yeah. But that raised the prices. That raised. Um, well, but it, it, but it came with the uh, but it came with the rate agreements. Securitization was part of a package with the rate agreements. So sometimes you deferred costs. And well, in Pennsylvania, Maryland, that was disastrous. Yes. But um, but you didn't immediately raise costs. Right. And there, the, and well, that just levelized them over a longer period, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's what it, it basically yeah, did. Yeah, so you, you crossed your fingers that there was going to be a benefit, and in Pennsylvania and Maryland there wasn't, right. and you lost commissions. And we, we had a 10-year freeze in Illinois, but we initially dropped the rates by 20% on our transition period. So for that 10-year period, people benefited quite well. And then we had the auction come in, and uh, prices, at least for Commonwealth Edison's territory, went up by about... 25 percent, but that was still like a two or three percent in real terms, based on what, you know that time period, a reduction in rates. But so nothing like we need 12 more gas measures, 70 percent. 70 percent in there, and that caused the commissioners to all get fired, and you know, and things of that nature. So they, the the political economy <laughs> comes but, in. I mean, a variation on this is what you're saying is actually what's happening with uh, renewable contracts, as I understand them, is that many of the long-term Power purchase agreements that utilities are having to do, they're having to carry them as sort of a debt equivalent um, on their balance sheets. And so, in effect, they're having to securitize those uh, in the way they're accounted for. But what Wall Street, Street, Street will do when you look at off balance sheet debt like that is start to give you a higher risk rating. And so, then that creates other problems over here that start to pile up. So, it's like a closed loop. You know, when we squeeze on one end, the other side, you know, the balloon just gets bigger over here. So, it's, it's tough. I like your talk very much. Thank you. Okay. I think the historical perspective is very interesting. But you really uh, provide us with a very pessimistic uh, view of uh, smart grid development that will not take place with the present race structure unless the utilities, the distribution utilities, see a benefit for them, for them uh, in, re in reducing their, their peak, peaking times or whatever. So how do you, is there a way out? Is there, well, is there a new rates, new rate scheme that could be developed uh, if it's going to be socially beneficial to develop this or what? I, I think it takes um, legislatures in most cases to say that they want this to happen and then pass laws that say that the commissions should treat the costs as trackers to flow through and things of that nature, which is partly what has occurred in Illinois. Um, they're still working out the kinks in that. But um, I, I tend to think if we really want to see this happen as an infrastructure industry, the, the legislatures have to step up and, and, and back that. And because otherwise, the, again, the risk, the rate case, the whole nine yards, that, that's, that's a tough decision for a lot of utilities. And I, and I, you know, I actually had, these are some of the states that have approved it. These are the ones that were conditional. And of course, some of these, I have another slide, which, you know, not to feed on the, my pessimism, but smart failures. 
uh, where, where a whole series of companies who have withdrawn their smart grid proposals as a result of problems that they've run into, mostly cost issues and rate increases and then the health questions and things of that nature. What do you do about some of the investments that we talked about actually over the last uh, couple of days um, that are mitig to mitigate some of the volatility or different operating characteristics of the grid from renewable or intermittent resources? Um, and those, the, the, there isn't really a benefit in the sense of the normal sort of reduction in OPEX that you would right. see. Um, there are benefits that are, you know, that, that policy has decided that they want to do as, as part of a renewable portfolio standard or something else. Uh, uh, and so how, how are you seeing regulators get their uh, sort of process around the idea that rate base may go up uh, for this investment, uh, that couple hundred billion or a couple hundred, uh, yeah, a couple hundred billion that was uh, talked about in EPRI uh, has, because uh, that affects the RB there. Right. Uh, but there's no corresponding uh, drop in operating expense. That's a hard sell. It's just a hard sell. And again, see, because it, I, it, they start to border on this public good nature that we've talked about, there are great reliability and other aspects to this. Then I think the legislatures, because it's a public good question, should be the ones that have to kind of order it to happen because this is a very backward looking reaction oriented system that doesn't tend to be forward looking. If you are lucky enough and the governor comes in and appoints commissioners and chair people to that have the vision and have been told that, yeah, you have my backing, then, then maybe it happens. But do, do you think some variant of sort of the benefits test concepts that were developed for energy efficiency or, or demand response that um, to try to deal with these facts that some of the stuff may not flow through a income statement that may be needed to address I, the, it, you know, the societal benefits of renewable, uh, but to be able to justify what the right level of investment is going to be needed and again, on the And again, that's what Illinois was basically doing, and it's collaborative. We, we estimated the, the, the societal benefits and the cost of putting it in, and we were coming up with a positive number and saying it's, it's worth going forward. And then ultimately, we went to the legislature, and, and they agreed and, and put it in and codified it. So, this, but is, it, this is a state-by-state state thing, right? It, I mean, it, it, each commission is different. It, it is, and very different. And, you know, nine states are elected, and, and the others are appointed, and so you have different situations that you come into contact with and different propensities to be forward-looking or to be um, just cautious and not want to take the risks. Because uh, I mean, a big problem here is, you know, somebody could have said, well, we put all that money in. Let's just say we spent it all in New Jersey. Not, again, not to be a, so pessimistic, but we put it all in New Jersey. Well, smart grid doesn't stop water from coming into substations and causing them to blow up. And so everybody would have said, well, I thought we spent hundreds of millions of dollars to make it a smart and better system. Well, they won't understand necessarily the difference between hardening and smartening and all that layers that I'm was talking about of the cost and they need to, you know, we need, again, I would say that one phrase in there, what are you selling to the customer? We have to do an extremely good sales job about explaining the benefits and understanding the social benefits. And I, I get into the arguments with, with potential customers and, you know, in, in, as a commissioner and I would have to say, well, do you still pay taxes for education? Your kids have all graduated, right? You know, you know and, oh, I hate doing it, but I still do it. Yeah, because you want to have smarter kids come up and have a better society. Well, it, it's the same arguments. It's the public good issue. Yeah. Hi, uh, you talked about monopoly and competition. I'm just wondering if competition has any role in any one of those parameters on the board. Um, it, for the restructured states, this commodity price will be determined by competition. The rest of it, well, okay, now I have to define what do we mean by competition. If I bid out the work that's done to put in smart grid and I have a competitive RFP on the part of the utility, then competition can take place to try to minimize the cost of what goes into the rate base. And when I buy fuel, I may do competitive bidding and things of that nature. So there's competitive processes going all along, but they're just all done within the context of an administrative price setting process. Well, uh, I think we should continue to 
continue the discussion over lunch. There's a lunch waiting for us. So thank you. Thank you. My pleasure.